great network that has been emerged, that has emerged. And I think if we were to find one person who has been responsible either directly by mentoring many of us in this network or indirectly by, you know, inspiring with your work, the issues of, of political economy and, and economic history in Latin America, that's obviously you. So, so this is really a treat for us. Welcome. Uh, Georgia will be moderating the, the talk today. Everyone, I think, knows the rules, but I, I will just uh, leave the floor to Giorgio and you from, from now on. Okay. So, thank you very much, uh, James, for accepting our invitation. Just a couple of reminders. So, there's going to be 40 minutes presentation where we will just allow clarifying questions that will need to be sent to me so through the chat. And I will be filtering them. So, I'm really choosing only clarifying questions. And anything that is more like a Q, a question, a thorough question, we'll be asking the Q&A. So after these 40 minutes, we will open the Q&A. You should raise your hand if you want to ask a question to, to, to Jim. And we'll go in chronological order. Uh, we'll try to accommodate time as much as we can. So this is it. So James, uh, thank you very much again for accepting this invitation. The floor is yours. And give us some hopes about the, about the continent. And this will be very much in line with our seven year series. Thank you. I think you need to unmute yourself. Just your yes. You are. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks very much for inviting me, and thank you for those those very kind uh, those very kind words. Um, so so what I'm going to do today is talk about. Uh, here we go. I'm going to talk about um, this paper, uh, w uh, which is a joint with uh, Jose Luis Falconi. And uh, and he's responsible for the, all the stuff on Peru in particular, as you'll see when we get going. So 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 this is you know I think this is something I've been struggling with, uh, and you know Jose and I've been struggling with, and I've been struggling with other friends, uh, which is to sort of try to rethink uh, the political economy of Latin America. I'm not going to talk too much about the bigger agenda because I have even less to say on that than the small agenda, as you'll see. You know this is very much a kind of think piece. With some examples, and you know, which we, which we think are interesting, uh, but but you know, say, if you're going to say one, this, if you're going to say what the bigger agenda was in one sentence, the bigger agenda, my own personal agenda, you know, is um, can I stop thinking about Latin America as a failed version of the United States? Can I can I start thinking of it as something different? You know, if I was going to talk about the political economy of Africa, I wouldn't. I, it would be impossible to think of it in those terms. You know, if I was going to talk about the political economy of China or, or the Islamic State or the Middle East, it would make absolutely no sense to think of it as a failed version of the United States. It's clearly something different. But we're also used to think of Latin America as wanting to kind of be, you know, have it, you know, this particular type of society and always failing, you know, and that's I'd like to stop thinking like that. Okay, so 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 that's the bigger agenda. So here, what are we talking about today? Well, you know, the start of the paper, which I'm not, I'm not, I'm, we'd, we'd be very, very happy for feedback on the paper. I'm not going to talk about the start of the paper because otherwise I'll never get to the kind of newer bits. The start of the paper is just to sort of remind you of some of the syndromes of, you know, the political economy of underdevelopment, which which you know most of us agree hold Latin America back and have held. Latin America back for a long time because they're so persistent and path dependent. And in particular, you know, it really focuses on this work that um, that Leopoldo and Carlos Molina and I have been doing about clientelism and state weakness in Colombia, how that leads to public good provision and a kind of lack of accountability and all the normal, the normal sort of things. So you could say, you know, to use the terminology of why nations fail, you know, why not? Uh, that's that's the usual story about extractive institutions. Latin America is held back by this kind of web of extractive institutions. Those are not good collectively, but they're held in place by by kind of political incentives that that we all that we all understand. Okay, uh, but but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to try to talk about well. There's a lot of truth in that, you know, and I I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, and we've all been kind of on that road in some sense since, you know, at least me personally, since I read, you know, Engelman and Sokolov's staggeringly influential article 23 uh, years ago, actually more than that, about 25 years ago when it came out as a working paper. But, but I just want to point out some problems with this, 
view of the hegemony of extractive institutions, which I feel very, which I feel are very interesting, which we feel are very interesting. And that's really what the paper is about, kind of trying to illustrate problems with this view of the hegemony of extractive institutions. And to illustrate in lots of ways, there may be many spaces and there must be maybe much more room for maneuver in Latin America than is suggested uh, by this, this, this discourse on extractive institutions. And the way I'm going to start by talking about that is to sort of back up and say, okay, we have this idea of a weak state, it's bad at raising resources, it's bad at regulating society, it's bad at providing public goods and order. Uh, but have we got exactly the right conceptualization of this state? And I'm going to argue no. And if you think, so I'm going to argue, I'm going to propose a different conceptualization of the state, which, which leaves a lot more room for non-extractive political projects. And I'm going to illustrate that with, Boli with an example from Bolivia. Probably I'll just wave at this example from Colombia. I have a map and I can talk about it for one second, but another example from Colombia. Okay. Uh, so, so this alternative conception of the state, you know, I think realistically allows for a lot more, as I say, room for maneuver for non-elite uh, political projects and much more inclusive and much less extractive political projects to germinate and even be, be successful. Okay? And I'm going to give you an example of that from Argentina, the unlikely case, you could say, of Peronism. Okay, so for me, and you know, I think this is very much the understanding of the contemporary historians of Peronism. Peronism, you know, was much more than a political coalition or political strategy. It was an identity. It was it emerged from society in a particular historical moment, and it came along with all sorts of cultural baggage and 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 manifestations. And Peron, you know, brilliantly harnessed that uh, into a political movement. But but I talk we talk about that example to sort of show where did these things come from? We're going to start talking about Bolivia, or whatever, and these non-elite political movements. But I want to try to convince you that whatever Peronism was, whatever its long-run implications for Argentine development were, it was definitely a non-elite political uh, movement that emerged from society in a way that existing elites were not able to control or repress or stop or whatever. Now you could say. You know, okay, that's fine, but what's there's a problem with Peronism. You know, what's the fly in the ointment? You know, well, the problem is that Peronism was a very Manichean identity, and you know, it was like them or us, and you're for me or against me, like Chavismo. You know, so and it it reproduced many of the the syndromes you know which it fought against. You could say clientelism. Peronism became you know extremely clientelistic, and so it just reproduced you know in a kind of iron law of oligarchy way. The things that supposedly it had been fighting against in the 1940s and 1950s. But I don't think that has to be true. Okay. I'm going to, in the Bolivian case, we're going to show that I'm going to try to illustrate, you know, that, that it's not true that what's emerged you know, with the mass or the cocoleros was a kind of super Manichean uh, identity. And at, at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk about this, this emergence of this sort of Cholo identity in Peru over the last 20 or 30 years. Again, kind of non-elite, organic, coming from society, but also much more inclusive, you know, not like Peronism, okay? So, so at the end of the day, I think what I want to say, what we want to say is, you know, how could you take this and be more optimistic about Latin America? Well, A, this kind of elite dominated thing, yeah, that might be true in Guatemala, you know? <laughs> It might be true in Paraguay, but it's not true in lots of parts of Latin America. There's lots of space for very different types of politics and very different types of social movements and projects to emerge, and they can be a lot more inclusive. And I think that's what's so interesting about this Peruvian case and, and the Bolivian case, you know, maybe not Peronism, maybe not Chavismo, but I, I, advance those, those, I advance those just to show, you know, how kind of dramatic revolutionary change is, is, is possible. Okay, so 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 what about this business of kind of conceptualizing this this weak Latin American state? Okay, and and here's a picture from the paper uh, by with Leopoldo and Carlos that, that I talk about. We talk about in the paper. I'm not going to talk about now. And I just show you this to say, on the left hand side is the the, the municipalities here, which are marked are the, the sample that we that we got data from, uh, and the darker it is on the left, sorry, the left is tax evasion, on the right is clientelism. The darker it is, the more tax evasion there is and the more clientelism. So I'm not gonna 
tell you how any of that's measured. You know what clientelism and tax evasion is. But you can see that, that, that this has a particular spatial pattern. You know, there's more clientelism and tax evasion on the Caribbean coast, in Sucre or Cordoba, in La Guajira, in, in Los Llanos, in Meta, for example. So, so there's a sort of core periphery structure uh, to this. And I think that's going to be very relevant to this argument. And, you know, in some sense, the first person who pointed this out, at least when I paid any attention to it, was O'Donnell. O'Donnell wrote, wrote this famous paper where he sort of said, you know, there are all these brown areas in Latin America. I don't know why he used the, word, the color brown, but the point was there's all these sort of ungoverned spaces. There's, there's a sort of fiction that the state rules the country or runs the country, but actually there's large ungoverned spaces in Latin America, what you call brown areas. And I think for us, the most interesting kind of account of this is, is this book, The Lettered City by, by Angel Rama, who is not a social scientist, uh, but, but, but it's a book about the history of the Latin American uh, state. And I think, you know, we've, we've got into this mode of thinking about elites and reproduction of elites and Engelman and Sokolov and, you know, and, and that's, that's all good. But like what he points out is that that's, True, but 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 Latin American states have always had this very utopian aspect to them. Okay, so so he points out that the origins of the state in colonial Latin America it was this extremely kind of utopian project where you know uh, what he what he emphasizes the kind of like the the way in which there's a disconnect between what actually happened and 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 reality, you know, and, or what he calls you know the the, the, the emphasis on potential over reality that so the, the, and you know this is something which i've experienced so many times especially in colombia this kind of disconnect between what people say is happening and what's going to happen and what you know is actually happening and could ever possibly happen okay so so he traces this sort of intellectually back to the colonial period and the notion that somehow this colonial project you know very much in the enlightened the period of the enlightenment and you know and it sort of transposed all these utopian designs you know thomas more's utopia when was that written you know at exactly the time of the expansion into the americas and and it was a kind of world freed from what he says like ordinary circumstances okay so you know so here's a great colombian example there's going to be too many colombian examples i apologize for that you know very recent which i kind of experienced firsthand you know so to speak which is el bronx so here's el bronx for those of, for the non-colombians in, in the non-colombians in the audience here's the presidential palace you know here's the plaza de bolivar and here's el bronx just just down the road you know so the president duque can nip out and buy some whatever you buy in El Bronx. Anyway, so this is a den of iniquity and vice and criminal activities, as you can see, just around the corner from the presidential palace. But it's in this beautiful thing, you know, which is Bogota. Just look at it. You know, in fact, here's, you know, uh, Rama points out, Bogota is like the prime example of a kind of utopian design. There's all these wonderful, it's also orderly, isn't it? You know, Colombia, doesn't it struck you how orderly it is? Look at these wonderful calles and carreras. They're all numbered. They're laid out in this perfect grid. Even El Bronx, you see, it's almost like a perfect square, you know. But what he points out is that time and time again, there's a sort of clash between the, somehow the people who run these countries, like, like, like Alcalde Peñalosa, sort of think that the city is actually the same as this utopian conception of it. So the letrados are the people that Rama describes as, you know, kind of conceiving of this, this, in, this utopian vision. Only letrados, like Peñalosa, Senor Peñalosa, a great example, could envisage an urban ideal after the construction of the city, preserving their idealized vision in a constant struggle with the material modifications introduced by the daily life of the city's ordinary inhabitants. So here's the constant struggle on the left. And indeed, you know, after El Bronx was cleared out, you can see the police and soldiers here clearing it out. What happens? Bogota police sweep addicts out of Bronx and into the Plaza de España. It just moves somewhere else. You know, actually my colleague, Chris Blackman even has a kind of econometric paper on this. You know, you clamp down on it and it moves somewhere else, okay? Uh, there's an older version, you know, by Ernesto Chagrodsky and Sebastian Galliani and Rafael Di Tella in Buenos Aires, they may not think of it like this, you know, uh, but, 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 but it kind of moves somewhere else and the thing is preserved. You know, why is that? Because, because there's a sort of equilibrium here and there's a disequilibrium between one's conception of how the city should be and how it actually, how it actually is.
Okay, so 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 there's this element of il an illusion of control. Okay, so 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 I you know what we what we do in the article is to sort of use this, which you might find a little outrageous, as a way of kind of saying you know this 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 a lot of the control of elites over society. Yeah, it's there. You know, Salinas de Gotari did privatize Telmex to Carlos Slim. You know, but a lot of the a lot of the you know control is illusory. Okay, and you know here's the Colombian example. You know, Colombian elites did not want Colombia to turn into the drug running, kidnapping, and homicide capital of the world. They just couldn't do they just couldn't do anything about it because they don't exercise control over large parts of the country except in their imagination, even just around the corner from the presidential palace. So to think about the state and the way the state works, you have to think about, well, how, how does that work then? You know, there's bits, there's these utopian bits, you know, where there's people kind of out of touch with reality, you know, thinking they govern these vacant spaces. And how does that governance actually work? Well, I think that's where the clientelism and the negotiation comes in. You know, and here's, a, here's an example of one of many, many, many one could cite. You know, again, it's Colombian. So let me tell you the story of John Calzones. You know, John Calzones. So, so, so he started out as a local businessman in Yopal, uh, uh, in Los Llanos. And he's called Calzones because, because he, made a, he made money selling ladies' underwear. So, so he started up some ladies' underwear shops. He made money. Okay, so then what did he do? Well, Yopal is a place, you know, with, with lacks, which lacks electricity and running water, even though it's a departmental capital. So he provided it. He took over some land, which had been confiscated from two paramilitaries, uh, and he started to build a ciudadela, la bendición. He put, he, you know, he flattened it, he put in electricity, he put in sewage, uh, water. And then he subsidized people to start building houses. He gave out thousands of lots to people to bit with all this infrastructure, all the kind of infrastructure and public services that the Colombian government doesn't provide in Yopal. And he got people, he subsidized people. Okay. He created a social base, a bit like Peron, actually, you know. So so he created a social base. And then what did he do? He ran for office. Okay. Movimiento Social La Bendición. No mas corrupción, you know, good slogan uh, in Colombia. There he is. Uh, and, you know, so he turned it into a kind of social movement. Uh, and what did he do? He ran for mayor of Yopal. So, so if you look at how this ungoverned periphery is governed, it's governed by harnessing local initiative, like this gentleman here. You know, all over Colombia, people mobilize, they provide public goods, they develop a base, a social base, they run for politics. And then the people in Bogota, negotiate with them. They kind of say, okay, this guy looks good. We can work with him, you know, deliver some votes and we'll give you some money and you can build another barrio, you know? So, so it's a very pragmatic kind of negotiation. Here's another, you know, pragmatic negotiation in Colombia, which is who are these gentlemen here? Well, this is uh, Ramon Isaza on the right. Uh, this is Mancuso, Salvatore Mancuso, and this is Ernesto Baez on the left. So these are three paramilitary warlords sitting in Congress, you know, talking about their their political project uh, with suits on, uh, you know, and 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 well, you know, what is this? It's the same thing. It's a little bit more militarized than John Calzones, but it's the guys who kind of mobilize. They get armed in the periphery. The Colombian government can't do anything about it, but then it. It negotiates with them, you know. It gets them to do stuff and provide public goods, or you know, it outsources assassinations or limpieza social or whatever. But it's same thing, just a little bit more out of control and militarized. Okay. So, 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 if that's your image, so you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity here, which I can't possibly do to do any justice to. And I'm going to give a Bolivian example. Of course, the Bolivian periphery looks a lot different from the Colombian periphery. Uh, uh, which is good news uh, for the Bolivians, but 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 you know here's a here's a sort of image you know which comes from C L R James's book about the Haitian Revolution, the Black Jacobins. If any of you have, have ever read it, you know. So 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 he's quoting the Marquis de Mirabeau. Mirabeau indeed said that the colonists in Haiti, the white colonists, slept on the edge of Vesuvius, but for centuries the same thing has been said. And the slaves had never done anything. So, so we don't know when this Vesuvius will explode, but but it but it probably will explode at some point. And 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 in a sort of collective way. So I think when you just these examples of John Calzones and these paramilitary commandantes in the Colombian Congress sort of suggest 
gosh, whatever's going on out there, you know, in Yopal or the Magdalena Medio or, 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 or Montes de Maria, like the people in Bogota really don't have much control uh, over it. Okay, so there's large ungoverned areas and, and you know, okay, not everywhere is like Colombia, but, but quite a lot of places are like Colombia. Okay, so where non-elite political projects can germinate. So if you think about the Colombian case, you know, the main non-elite political project which germinated, you could say, would be the guerrilla, you know, and the kind of legacy of the Cuban revolution. So, 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 so that's, you know, that's not exactly what I have in mind or what we have in mind here. So, so let me talk about another one of a, of a kind of political project germinating in, in this ungoverned spaces outside the lettered city, which is the rise of the cocoleros. So, 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 you know, so here's the, so he, this is, so here's the, this is, this red line here is the, uh, is the mass vote share. So from the mid 1990s, you know, mass more or less didn't exist, a uh, movement towards socialism. Uh, it started out as a movement of trade unionists growing coca, okay? And the cocaleros formed a political party. They formed a coalition with a lot of other groups, including a lot of indigenous uh, groups who are extremely organized. And then they entered politics. Why did they enter politics? Well, you know, here's one of the reasons they got so organized and entered politics was there was an enormous uh, ramp up of anti-narcotics activities during the Banza government. In fact, the United States persuaded uh, General Banza to, to, to adopt a policy of zero coca. Okay. So, so this was a sort of staggering violation in some sense of, 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 of the equilibrium such as it was in in Bolivian society. So I think a lot of this equilibrium, you know, between the core and periphery, you could say, is, is, is a kind of equilibrium where there are rules and there's norms. And, you know, part of the norm is, you know, you don't mess with each other. You know, you don't mess with the center. The center doesn't mess with the periphery. You kind of negotiate and exchange. Uh, but the zero coca was a massive violation of uh, the social contract or, or what we say in the paper, the moral economy that I use. So this is, you know, inspired by by E. P. Thompson, the British historian's notion of like how local society functioned in early modern Britain. He said there was a kind of moral economy, and the moral economy was a set of norms and social practices which were which were kind of outside the scope of the national state in London, and which the national state really couldn't mess with. The local institutions were run by you know by local people, the justices of the peace. The, the 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 police, you know, the the the, the commissioners of the poor law. The, they, these were all local people who were chosen, you know, by lot, uh, and and who forced enforced these norms. And Thompson pointed out that a lot of the problems, you know, disturbances in early modern England were caused when the state sort of challenged these this this moral economy. And so that's that's how one could think about this. You know, the origins of the mass, the origins of this kind of political reaction. And the capture of the state uh, in 2005 is an enormous reaction of the sort Thompson described in England of a violation of this this moral economy because coca you know coca is just so kind of it's so involved in all the practices of of indigenous society in 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 Bolivia but but who would have known that in La Paz you know so this is a fantastic example in some sense like why on earth would Banza adopt such a policy but because because he had, because he just was out of touch with the country he was, he was, he was governing. Okay. So, so, but what's the consequence of this? You know, well, you know, here's, here's the moral economy. Uh, here's the moral economy in action in the IU, you know, the IU, I haven't talked about the details of this, you know, but, but the Cocoleros, of course, were an interesting, that was a mixture of all sorts of people who went, you know, into the Chapare Valley to grow coca or whatever, but when they form a coalition with indigenous people, they're able to tap into this staggeringly organized indigenous society. So, so this, you know, when I said, you know, the, the Bolivian periphery doesn't look like the Colombian periphery, that's because there's all of these indigenous people who are incredibly organized. So this is the officials of Ayu uh, in Oruru, uh, in Orinoco. And, you know, you can see the officials of the IU. I'm not an official of the IU, uh, but, 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 but there they are. You know, and this is a, I can't talk about it, but this is a fabulous, the IU is a fabulous institution. You can see that, they're, that all, the official, all the official positions are paired men and women. So it's very inclusive in a gender sense also. It's not just inclusive socially. And of course, there's a dense web of reciprocity and institutions and ability to kind of enforce rules, judicial 
collective action. So, so this was a, you know, this was a kind of time bomb waiting to go off in some sense for the people in La Paz, but it took a particular set of events to, to trigger this. Okay. So, so, you know, but we're saying here, this is, this is, you know, this is the Bolivians were sleeping on a volcano, uh, but, but it was a much more inclusive volcano than, 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 you know, than in Yopal. And here's some evidence from the, to, in, inelegantly scanned from the World Bank webpage, uh, which is, I'm just checking. Okay. Uh, which is, what happened to inequality in Bolivia uh, since Morales came to power? It's rather staggering, actually. I know inequality has fallen in Peru and lots of parts of, of Latin America, uh, even Chile, uh, in the last 20 years. So, so this, you know, I'm not testing hypothesis here. I'm just saying, you know, we have other evidence uh, about the impact of this on social mobility, you know, which I, I'm not going to talk about. But, but here's just a sort of sliver of evidence, you know, at least this is consistent, you know, this is this is a staggering fall in the Gini coefficient uh, from about, you know, 0. 0.6 uh, down to about 0. 0.42 during this period of 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 the, the, the hegemony of the Morales government. So so here's a movement that germinated in the periphery, a much more inclusive movement, uh, and it's captured the central state and delivered enormous improvements, particularly for indigenous people. OK, I'm not going to talk about Afro-Colombian land rights, but this is actually also a fantastic uh, uh, triumph of inclusion in the Colombian Pacific, that Afro-Colombian people who were kind of finally recognized as existing in the 1991 constitution were able to establish collective property rights for huge swaths of the Pacific. You see all this purple bit uh, in the right hand side map. So, so how did they do that? It's a, again, it's a story of the lettered city. It's a story of, of the inability of elites to kind of understand and control and manage the process. Okay, so, uh, all right. So, oops, okay. So, 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 so there's two examples, you know, of sketch very rapidly, uh, just to illustrate there's a lot going on here other than elite dominated extractive institutions. Okay, and I think, you know, I want to say even that's that's the right way to think about Peronism, you know, like what was I always, you know, like I, I'm always struck by how 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 much more hierarchical Colombia is uh, as a society than 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 Argentina. And so, you know, one natural hypothesis, there's many hypotheses for that could be historical migration, investment in education. But one hypothesis is that, you know, this really is a fruit of Peronism. This is a fruit of the descamisados. You know, if you read what Peron said, uh, he endlessly emphasized this uh, egalitarian kind of anti-elite uh, rhetoric. And I think the, the you know, the, the, I think that's, there's a lot of, if you look at the details of policy, then what he did is in many ways consistent with that. What he did is very complicated, uh, but, but he also pushed labor reform. And the evidence that you know, I can find, which comes from Facundo Alvarez, is Peronism, again, there's lots of confounders, did coincide with very large falls in inequality. So this is Facundo Alvarez's data uh, on, on the top income shares in Argentina from the mid 1940s. You know, there's a lot of missing observations and gaps in the data, but this is at least certainly consistent with the idea that Peronist policies led to very large falls in inequality. I think that, you know, this is one of the photographs that Peronist historians or historians, Argentine historians uh, love, you know, to show, which is the famous invasion of the descamisados of, 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 of the Plaza Mayo, you know, after when Peron was imprisoned uh, in 1945 in the military when he fell out with the rest of the people in the junta. And, you know, this is used to show Peronism really was a social revolution. You know, these people are wearing, these guys are wearing shirts, but they're doing something very naughty and uncivilized, which any real porteño would never do. They're washing their feet, you know, in the fountains of the Plaza de Mayo, which, which, uh, don't do that, Giorgio, if you're in Buenos Aires. Okay. So that's a no, no. All right. So, 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 so I, you know, like, so, but let me, I'm sorry, this. sorry to interrupt. Yes. Just a reminder, like yeah. you have 10 minutes left. 10 minutes. Okay. That's good. Yeah. So, so, but, but I want to say, you know, we want to say in the paper also, you know, think about this. This is an ideology. Like why is Peronism being so persistent in Argentina? Because it's more than just a political coalition or a political strategy. It's, it's, a, it's an idea. It's an identity. It came out of society. That's, that's very much the emphasis of the historians of Peronism uh, nowadays. 
and 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 so 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 it was molded into a political project but but it's an identity it came out of society it was a non-elite identity it was a very popular identity in many ways it used lots of popular elements of culture and and it took over the state it captured the state okay and and i think that's that's we think that's very interesting okay so so sure these are very Mani manichean identities but let me show you another non manichean oh, what am I doing here? No, I'm not going to be able to do this properly. But I do. I stopped sharing, but I, but I messed it up, I think. Yeah, we can still see your slides, Jim. Okay, so... Oh. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, share file. No. How do I stop sharing? I wanted to stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. All right. Gosh, how incompetent. Sorry. All right. Let's. Oh, man. Sorry. I had this all set up and now it disappeared. Okay. All right. We're getting there. Sorry. No problem. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Can you see me? No. Can you see this? Can you see the bit? We can see YouTube, yeah. Por el solo hecho de ser peruano. You can see it, okay. Tiene derecho a gozar de lo ah. maravilloso que es ser peruano. Perú, Nebraska. 569 habitantes, un grifo, un restaurante, una avenida, un banco, un museo, una estación de tren que, bueno, ahora sirve para otros fines, su escuela, su tanque de agua, su alcaldía y un sheriff cuyo último trabajo fue separar a un perro de un gato en 1998. Perú, Nebraska, tiene un problema. Son peruanos, pero no saben qué significa ser. Listo, muchachos, llegamos. Vamos, vamos, Cristian. Vamos, dale. Nuestra misión es ser embajadores de nuestro país y leerle sus derechos como peruanos. Ustedes son de Perú. Tienen derecho a comer rico. Okay, I think I think uh... No, hold on. All right, so you got you got the idea. I won't I, you know. They're, 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 they're Peruvians in Peru, Nebraska. Uh, but they don't know what that means. They don't, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, they don't know what that means. To, they don't know what that means to be a Peruvian. Okay, so, so, so what, what does it mean to be a Peruvian? Well, everyone has the right to eat well. What, a, what, a, what, a, what an odd thing. But I think like what, what, what we try to say at the end of the paper is to say, like, talk about non elite, you know, social change in society. A fantastically interesting example is this notion of this emergence of uh, this, this emergence of this, uh, ah, uh, you could say this, this, this Cholo identity in, uh, in Peru. And this, the emergence of Peruvian cuisine, what is that? You know, it's the perfect example of a kind of mestizaje of many different sorts of cuisine, Andean cuisine, Western cuisine, Asian cuisine. You know, it's a kind of economic model. It's a cultural and social uh, phenomena that's kind of spread around the world. But it reflects a very different type of society uh, emerging in Peru. You know, it's, it's interesting that I read something uh, that Jose sent me about Peru recently, and it uses this expression about talking about Odebrecht uh, you know, that, that the fish rots from the head down, you know. But I guess what we're saying is that's completely the wrong way to think about what's gone on in Peru. You know, what's gone on in Peru is, yeah, there are these corrupt presidents and Odebrecht and stuff like that. 
But don't fixate on that. Fix it on the underlying social change that's been going on that's creating an extremely different type of society, which is radically different from this kind of old elite, you know, non-elite type of society that we try to think about, that we often think about in this political economy of Latin America. Okay, so, you know, this is more like a French analyse kind of way of thinking about, you know, focus on the underlying sort of slow moving social structure. And then you see something super different in Peru. So, you know, can I show you some data on that? Well, you know, I don't know if this counts as data, but back in 1986, Alan Garcia, when he was pre the late Alan Garcia, when he was president, he brought together what people called the 12 apostles, you know, which were like the 12 biggest business oligarchs. Uh, you know, to, to kind of back his plan, you know, to the extent he had a plan. Uh, and you can see what's interesting in these. Here's the list on the left, 1986. All of these people, you know, where were they from? They were Limeño uh, elites, like many of them, you know, traditional uh, families, businesses going back to the 19th century. There's a recent update of this by a, so, a Peruvian sociologist. And here's the new apostles on the right. And Look at the change between 1986 and 2020, okay? Some of them are there, you know, the Benavides are still there, the Brescias are still there, the Romeros are still there, uh, but half of them are now from the provinces, from Cajamarca, from Ayacucho, from Arequipe. They're like, there's a whole new class of business elites. And, you know, here's, a, we've, I pulled from the web the photos of these people. And, you know, what's really interesting is you see, like, you know, just without, I'm not going to talk about who's Cholo and who's not Cholo because, because I'm not Peruvian enough to understand how to use that word appropriately. But you can see that this is a, just a much, diver, much more diverse set of people uh, than if I'd had the photographs in 1986. Okay, so, so that's, that we think, ah, that, that we think is interesting. So, so, so what, are, what are we saying here? We're trying to say, look, this extractive stuff, that's okay, but there's a lot of stuff it's not capturing. There's a lot of space, there's a lot of potential for different, very different kind of inclusive projects to germinate. Here's some examples. You know, I think the Bolivian case is an example of that. I think what's been going on in Peru, you know, is an example of that. And it's a bit like China. You know, you, if you looked at for corruption and all sorts of dysfunctionality in China, you could certainly find it. But underneath that, there's a there's a society which in many ways is very organized and consistent with prosperity, focused with norms of meritocracy and bureaucracy. And, you know, and so it, in the Chinese case, if you just focused on Odebrecht, the Chinese, I know Odebrecht didn't get to China, but if they had got to China, you know, you could focus on that and you'd sort of think, oh, gosh, you know, the fish rots from the head down. But if you ignored that and thought of that as noise and focused on the kind of underlying more sociological aspects of China, then you see something different. And I think that Peruvian case is like that. That's a, maybe a very Peruvian argument. You know, you don't see anything like Cholo identity in Colombia. It's not relevant in other parts of Latin America. It's just an example of, you know, are we looking in the wrong place? You know, we endlessly have these intuitions about we can solve these problems, you know, if we if we you know, can just get the institutions right or we can you know, do randomized audits you know, with all, all respect to my former students and, and all this other stuff. And, you know, so, but this is saying, like, can we look somewhere different? Can we look at other forces or use other instruments to think about how different political coalitions or forces might, might emerge? And, and I think you know, just this you know, one could talk about other examples. We talk a little bit about the Mexican Revolution in the paper. I'm not going to talk about that now. Uh, you know, this is a very different model, this model of Cholo, the Cholo identity. You know, it's a very different way of thinking about society than you have uh, in the United States. And I also find that uh, very interesting. And, and, but but let, me, let me shut up and, 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 and answer questions. I think I've probably said enough to give people a sense of what the paper is about. So thank you very much, Jim. Um, now we're gonna open the floor for questions. So if you have anything you would like to ask Jim, now is the time and I ask you to kindly raise your hand, which is the bottom you should see on the right part of your screen. So please let me know. Okay. So I see Alberto Simfer have a question. So if we can unmute him, that would be very nice. 
Alberto, Hello? now you're. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Jim, this is fascinating. Uh, one question. So, uh, one thing that emerges from this, in, in my view, is that well, you're moving away from from the from the, uh, the incentives that institutions provide and the structure that institutions provide. So, my question is, what are you really saying? Are you really saying that uh, you know culture and informal norms and all that become important precisely because those places and those the vast areas are ungoverned and therefore have no institution have a institutional vacuum or are you saying that uh they always matter and 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 the force of culture and and, and informal norms actually competes with a force of formal institutions yeah i mean i wouldn't say you know they're ungoverned by elites but they have a, they have you know like if you thought about this example of the iu from bolivia you know that's heavily institutionalized uh you know, so so there's enormously dense social norms and and regulations, and so you know a lot of it may be informal, in that Northian terminology, but it, but it's just as real. It's just that you know it's outside the scope of the control of the central state. You know, I mean that that of course is something much more deeply rooted in history than what you see in the Colombian, you know, countryside. Uh, um, but 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 I you know so they're sort of pluralistic in that you know the sort of institutional pluralism perhaps that's the way to talk about it you know there's there's very different institutional orders and one of it is this kind of extractive Carlos Slim type of order but there's other orders you know and, and that must be completely true in Mexico you know uh, 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 you know as true as it is in Bolivia in large parts of certainly southern Mexico. So, 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 I, you know, that, I guess that's what I'm saying. I, you know, I, I don't know it's about culture. I don't use the word culture very often, as you know. Uh, I'm happy with informal institutions. Okay, thank, thank you, Alberto. Now, the next in line is Claudio Ferraz, if we can unmute him. And please, Claudio, ask your question. Now we should be able to hear you. Okay. Hi, Jim. Uh, Super interesting. Great to see you now becoming a sociologist, not only an economist and political scientist. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think it's super interesting. Is, should we think, I mean, a lot of these changes, I think, uh, and definitely Peru is only one of them, but, but they seem to be happening in, in Latin America. I mean, the inequality decreased for a decade everywhere, right? Like in, in across different countries, uh -huh. like uh, Brazil, in Argentina, in Colombia, in Ecuador. I mean, it's, it's really like a, a widespread phenomena. Uh, but at the same time, so, so that's on, on one side. And on, on the other side, the whole, I think it's super interesting to think about the, the Peruvian example but it's still kind of coordinated by the elite, right? So if you think about where the gastronomy revolution starts, it's really with this guy, Gaston Arcurio, which, is, I mean, he is still part of the elite, right? It's just that maybe it's a more innovative elite that have a different vision for, for the country, right? So, so should we think that we need to be lucky to have right, kind of like the right elite combined with some sort of redistribution to shift an equilibrium and open up space for, Kind of like new groups and new political entrepreneurs like how how, how should we think about this yeah um, i mean you're right the inequalities fall in everywhere but you you've seen my regressions on social mobility in bolivia you know so so that i think there's you know there's there's some evidence that this is connect you know that there's real kind of change in mobility and inequality which is connected to the rise of the mass you know i think you know, I think the Acurio, he's like the kind of Peron of Peruvian cuisine, isn't he? He's just sort of harnessing, you know, all of this other stuff that's going on. He's a kind of entrepreneur, you know, he's a he's a sort of cultural entrepreneur, if you like. Oh, I use that word. But 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 you know, but but I you know, I, I guess we want to emphasize that that this this cuisine, it's it's it is this sort of mestizaje. It's coming out of this kind of real mixtures of people and and ideas and, and and cultures and histories and you know and languages and and uh and and so that's a very inclusive thing yeah he's you know he's an elite or whatever but 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 i think you know lots of other people are being pulled along in that in that uh way of course you know there's still you know you see what's going on in peru now with covid19 you know, it's there's still problems with having a lock a vacuum, you know, of, of state services in, in, in peripheral Lima in terms of access to health and and uh, that's a sort of complete disaster. So 
so this is you know this is a work in progress i'm not i guess we're not advertising this as like being some staggering success it's very much a work in progress um but 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 so i you know i, I, I those inequality trends may be there but i think you know i i think it's just these social trends like we find very interesting i i don't know whether you need you always need you know leadership or entrepreneurship or political or economic or social i guess to sort of gel these things into into uh into something into a political movement you know but 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 i think it's that i'm talking about or we're talking about the kind of the elements that are there to be orchestrated by on by political entrepreneurs i guess um, claudio i don't know whether you raise your hand again uh if you want to follow up a bit but if not i have another question okay can we unmute claudio a bit just to be sure that is claudio are you no, i just wanted a quick compliment so one thing i mean uh, I, I'm not observing a lot what's happening in terms of like society at the local level, but one thing that emerged in a very interesting way in Brazil with the COVID was a lot of local movements in the favelas, in the slum, organizing to get like food to people and organize in ways where the state was not reaching, right? On the one hand, you do have like kind of organized crime reaching that space. But you also have a lot of super organized local level movements occupying also that space. And that's an example of like this local entrepreneurs that once they have a, 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 a hole there, they like they're feeling the space that the state is not feeling. And, and that can generate future leaders in next elections, whatever. So, so I think there are these interesting dynamics. Yeah. Okay, great. Then. Thank you, Claudio. The next in line is Juan Camilo Cárdenas. So if we can unmute him. Okay, Juan Camilo, we can hear you now. So let's go. Yes, uh, Jim, hi. It's good to hear you and, and, and continuing hearing you about these explorations. It's always uh, stimulating. I, I was wondering about the, the bottom-up social movements that you described with more examples with the indigenous case. Um, you mentioned the, the case of the Afro-Colombian movement for getting recognition to land titling, but I want to go further in the case of Blacks in Latin America as compared to indigenous in the in the growing of um, participation in, in creating other elites. Uh, what's your take on, on how the black population in American in Latin America being huge. If we come back to slavery, that the vast majority of slaves came to the to, to Latin America as opposed to North America, and yet you don't see much of these explorations of blacks getting into the newer elites, into the newer access to economic or political uh, um, elites. Uh, do you have something in mind on what is happening in terms of the? invisibility of, of blacks and black leadership as opposed to indigenous in your case i don't know that's a great question but i'm not i'm not sure i know enough about about the topic to answer it you know you you tell you tell me i mean i i i mean i've witnessed myself you know just in colombia since i started going to colombia when black people black people didn't exist in colombia <laughs> and now they do exist you know and that's been a that's been a remarkable that's been a remarkable transformation, you know, in the last 30 years. Uh, but I'm not sure I know enough about the facts uh, elsewhere, honestly, to be able to comment on that. In I guess Brazil would be the the place where that was, you know, of a huge order of magnitude. But I, I'm honestly not sure I understand enough about that topic. That's that's something that you know that that's something for us to study, I guess. Right. So I don't see any other question, but if you have the question now, is the time to raise your hand? So, so Giorgio, I think you are missing some people who asked through the Q&A. Oh, um, okay. So unfortunately, so please try to raise your hand rather than use the Q&A so that Giorgio doesn't have to look at several windows. And I think we have Julian Gomez and then Rashid. And I also raised my hand, but let's, let's allow the participants to go first. Okay, so let's unmute Julian Gomez then. Let's see. Okay. 
so the okay so perhaps there is a like a bit of a problem the question from uh, Julian was is the okay so that, that we can skip it uh, so Rashid um, can we unmute Rashid yeah please go on yeah, me. Can you, Hello? Can, you, you can talk now, yes. Yes. Thank you, Jim, for this uh, very nice, thought-provoking presentation. Uh, so, so I'm wondering whether the argument is there is this underlying force that is perhaps less observable than what's happening really in the elite who have the illusion of dominating, but they are not really what's affecting it. But is the argument that this underlying force really becomes influential when it gets to power, as it is the case in in Bolivia, in the Evo Morales, as you are showing at the at some point that they get into power and that's where it really becomes influential. Or even if it doesn't get into the central power, a lot of, a lot of what's happening is the well-being of, of individuals, the, the effects of inequality are there anyway, whether it gets into the central power or not. Because we see that inequality goes down when they actually get into power. So you, you kind of state both in the same presentation. Yeah, I don't think I don't think this equilibrium, you know, this sort of lettered city equilibrium has been great for Latin America. You know, I think it allows elites to, you know, exploit all sorts of things, create monopolies and preferential access to all sorts of things. You know, it leads to kind of massive under provision of public goods in 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 the periphery. So so I think, you know, that's why it's important to capture the to capture the state in some sense, you know, because Otherwise, your access to resources are limited and your ability to influence the national political system, you know, is very limited, you know, and so, so, so I think so I think that's I don't think the initial, you know, the, the initial equilibrium that E.P. Thompson was talking about in early modern England was a much more kind of functional one. Uh, uh, but I think it's not so functional, you know, in if you know, if you go to these places in rural Bolivia or whatever, you know, there's no state functionaries. There's very few public goods now. There might be electricity because because Evo Morales, you know, they stuck electricity up all over the place. But but you know, they're 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 they they're bereft of 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 you know what we think of as essential public goods. So I don't. I, I'm not saying that initial situation is advantageous collectively, you know, or even for the people in the periphery. I'm just saying. It's of a nature which which allows for a lot more possibility, I think, than this kind of extractive narrative uh, would suggest. I guess that's the main point. And they were trying to illustrate there's all sorts of, you know, just this very lack of control creates all sorts of potential. You know, the sleeping on Vesuvius, as CLR James said it. Okay, thank you. Now let's try. If we have two questions from Diego Astorga and Pablo Carubin, perhaps we're taking back to back, and then Jim, you can reply because we are actually going out of time. So, if Diego Astorga can be unmuted, that would be nice. Uh, hello, uh, very interesting. Thank you. I just wanted to 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 know your opinions about whether social media can foster the development of new political movements differentially from the typical elites basically and thanks <laughs> okay so let, let us take the okay uh, the next question as well pablo Carubin, are you there yeah i'm here can you hear me yeah very well okay, so this is uh jim this is uh, super interesting and i just wanted to make a comment related to what claudio mentioned about the role of gangs which is I keep thinking about what's the equivalent for Colombia of all of this beyond the examples of, you know, the Afro-Colombian or indigenous communities. And I, you alluded to this earlier, but I think that the drug, the illegal drug culture uh, is somewhat related to this in the sense that it was very disruptive to the elites. It provided a vehicle for upward mobility and for wealth accumulation uh, for lots of people in places in which they otherwise wouldn't have been able to do it. And you do see it as a threat to some extent to a lot of members of the elite. So, um, and you know, and it, and I don't think it created a political movement openly about this, but it certainly had implications for the political equilibrium. So I don't know to what extent you think that, you know, the way in which the drug culture and the culture of easy money in Colombia, um, you know, fits into this narrative about like a disruptive anti-elite uh, 
movements? Yeah, I, I mean, that's an interesting question. You know, if you thought about the history of English capitalism, you know, there's a lot of English people made a fortune, you know, selling. They made a fortune slave, you know, uh, slave raiding and slave trading as well. So there was all sorts of uh, highly, you know, dubious economic activities led to upward social mobility and uh, social change in, in England. So so I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, you know, I, my, my general view, I guess, would be the, dr the drug industry in Colombia was more like John Calzones. You know, it was kind of negotiated with, let's not forget that Pablo Escobar ended up as a suplente on a liberal list to Congress. You know, how, why did he do, why, how did that happen? That's the same thing. It's the negotiation, you know? So, so, so that, that, that they were sort of contained, you know, in, in, in this, in this, um, they were contained, you know, when Pablo Escobar couldn't be contained, contained, he had to be, he had to be got rid of, you know, um, I don't know, I'd have to think more about that. But I guess I, you know, it's sort of, in Colombia, you haven't seen this germination of a kind of larger project, you know, w with a sort of transformative potential in the way that you've seen in Bolivia, or maybe you're seeing in Peru, or, um, you know, why is that? Well, I think that's a complicated, you know, historical process. Obviously, indigenous people are interesting here, right? Because indigenous people are enormously organized, and they have, you know, huge, Kind of collective resources that 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 frontier campesino society in Colombia do, doesn't really have. It doesn't have that social capital in the same way a, you know a, a Aymara Ayus does. Um, you know, I would say in, in terms of social media, well, Leopoldo has a great paper about this. Leopoldo and Carlos Molina have a great paper, the natural experiment on the spread of. Um, Facebook, you know, which I recommend if you're interested in the connection between social media and uh, collective action. So, so, so certainly there's some there's some there's some well identified um, evidence on this topic. I I I don't know. I mean, I you know, my view of all of these things, uh, technology, you know, technological innovation, you know, it's all about the kind of interaction with the initial equilibrium. You know, these things can be good, but it all depends on how they're used and, you know, and, and in what context and who has access to them. So I don't, I don't think I have a clear, I, I only have a very complicated conditional answer to that. You know, if you thought about the academic literature, think about the political economy literature, the impact of like grade radio, you know, you've got David Stromberg's paper about the 1930s in the US, you know, you've got Ruben Enikolopov and, and, and Maria Petrova's paper about Hitler, you know, you've got, you've got David Yamagazawa's drops, paper, you know, radio paper about the Rwandan genocide, you know, there's just terrific heterogeneity from a kind of a particular technology doesn't really have any consequences, it has very conditional consequences. I guess Leopoldo was estimating the average effect, and that's pretty interesting to know the answer to that. Uh, but but I, I I'm not sure. So his his results would say you know that's good that's good for collective action and it's good for I guess it's good for fostering a more inclusive equilibrium in Latin America. Is that the right conclusion, Leopoldo? Yeah. Well, we try to be a bit cautious on the welfare effects, but we can definitely say that it increases. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Great. So we have time perhaps for the last two questions since we started a little bit late. Diego Aisinena, I hope I'm pronouncing you your surname correctly. And then Leopoldo, there are no more people on the way. Okay, Diego, please answer okay. question. Thank you, uh, Jim, very interesting. Uh, quick question. So your story is a story about optimism towards you know, greater inclusiveness or, or moving towards a more inclusive equilibrium. But you mentioned some counter examples, uh, Guatemala and Paraguay, if I recall correctly. So. Some of these counterexamples may may have to do with elites, uh, perhaps. Well, or you can think of it: traditional and non-traditional elites colluding to keep an exclusionary zone out, outside non-elites. So, so how does that prevent from happening in in other places, or or how do you prevent uh, elites, uh, including non-traditional elites, to essentially colluding and keeping exclusions on the rest of of society? Yeah, I mean, those examples, you know, I sort of threw those out. I mean, Paraguay is actually interesting, you know, like Paraguay is the one Latin American country where, you know, 
white people speak uh, indigenous language. You know, everyone speaks Guarani in, in Paraguay. It's absolutely fascinating. You know, I, I don't know the history of that, but 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 that that is, you know, people, that's not true that everyone speaks Quechua in Peru, you know, or, or, or Aymara, whatever, in, 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 in El Alto. So, so, so that that's that's a sort of fascinating fact about Paraguay. I just feel, you know, if you've been to Par Paraguay, is a very, you know, unmodernized uh, place, and it still suffers from, you know, many of kind of much more deeply rooted extractive institutions even than than anywhere else I've ever been in Latin America. So, so, and I think Guatemala, you know, has such a history of kind of extractive institutions and violence and you know exploitation. Uh, that that you know that I guess like you know that just seems like very challenging you know to imagine that happening, but but you're you're right you know you're right that that will stop you know the Spanish colonial authorities uh, run run Latin America well you know they ran it indirectly through 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 indigenous leaders you know and in fact if you ever looked at a, 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 in detail at a grant of encomienda. You know, which sort of divided the rents, you know, between, you know, sort of described how much stuff the Spaniards were going to get, how much labor they get and how much resources or whatever. The cacique, you know, or, or was always getting stuff too. the priests were getting stuff The you know, the encomendero was getting stuff, but the cacique was getting stuff too. So the caciques were given a kind of vested interest in this in this system. So, so, so sure, sure, that could that could. That could happen again, you know, but but that could happen, and you know, maybe it has happened. Uh, it has happened in the past. Uh, um, but you know, I think like the thing about Colombia, for example, is it's just much too unstable to kind of have relationships like that. You know, everything is continually negotiated and renegotiated. As Pablo was saying, you know, there's there's just a lot of sort of social mobility in this periphery, uh, in 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 Colombia. And I think you know, if you take the Bolivian case, you know, my my impression is that. It's very hard to kind of corrupt these institutions because there's just so much kind of accountability and so much control over these uh, these local institutions of the IU or the you know whatever. Like it's just there's there's a lot of accountability and representation. So there's institutionality which makes it difficult to capture. Uh, and in Colombia, you don't really know who to capture. You know, so 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 I, I'm sure that incentive is there, but 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 but. Paulo, do you want to ask your question? Uh, okay, if we can keep uh, Jim a couple of more minutes, uh, we're still uh, we're already a bit late. But yeah. but I just wanted to make um, uh, a short comment because I, I think that this idea that on the margins where the state is less present, there is this space for for non elite political projects to emerge and breathe. I think their their examples are fascinating, and the talk was very illustrative on that. I guess the the really challenging question that I that I think uh, it's it's key in this whole story is what determines what happens in the relationship between these these groups and the state, right? So on the one hand, I I, I think of examples much like uh, what uh, I I think I mentioned this before to you, Jim uh, Julieta Lemaitre's work on Colombia uh, in in her book, uh, the, the state always arrives late. People solve their problems. There is political leadership in these margins. And then the state arrives with some solutions that are completely dysfunctional for these groups. And then there's some tension and, and they cannot almost work together because the solutions that the people have come up with are just inconsistent with what the state has uh, has for them. Then there, another, another possibility, which I perhaps think is what happens in examples like the Chavismo example that you mentioned, is that these groups are successful, but they then tap into the existing extractive powers of the state that they were fighting against. And they become yet another kind of extractive group, and it's not like much hope for optimism there. Uh, then the other example is like the the drug uh, industry in Colombia, which perhaps is one in which you get this bargaining and you get co-opted, and that's essentially what happens. So I think that the, the the successful stories are those where there are spaces actually in the in the state where these groups can, can tap into and use them to their, to their own advantage, but not in a kind of extractive way. And so I think that the black, the black movements in Colombia are a nice example of that, because much of their, of, their, of their struggles have been outside and in the margins of the state, but they also kind of 
enthusiastic and actively use the constitution to 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 do stuff that they they want to so i think that uh, i see all of these kind of roads and i guess the question is it would be really interesting to have kind of a comparative theory which would take you to towards one world or another right um yeah. so i don't know this this is maybe not a question just a comment but but i i just kept thinking about this second step when you were when you were sharing all these very interesting examples yeah Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think you're right. You know, you're sort of alluding to what Daron and I call the iron law of oligarchy. You know, in 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 um, in why nations fail. You know, that there is this element of you know, there's a very interesting book called We Elected Chavez, uh, which is by this anthropologist and political scientist about kind of collective act, co sort of collective organization in you know in like poor areas in in poor barrios in in Caracas and how. You know, they they say, you know, we we created Chavez, you know, we 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 elected him, you know, we, you know, we it's sort of this very bottom up element of it. But then, as you say, it kind of takes on all of the kind of bad <laughs> characteristics of the previous regime, you know, kind of system of, you know, very clientelistic and that they were fighting against, you know, so, 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 you know, so I guess, you know, here the emphasis is to sort of say, well, you know, maybe there's a, some sort of social basis for like a non clientelistic, you know, those were places in some shanty town, you know, in Caracas, probably they all, you know, maybe they organized collectively, but they probably already had a very clientelistic type of relationship with local politicians in the, you know, the COPE and the old kind of pre Chavista political equilibrium in Venezuela. So that was a kind of natural way of operating. But I think, you know, if you look at these Bolivian or this Peruvian case, it seems there's a sort of social change that kind of creates, you know, a collectivity or, or an identity, which is perhaps a sort of underpinning of a, of a much more public good type uh, politics. Uh, so that's one way of saying. So I guess that's, that's, you know, why doesn't the iron law of oligarchy apply here? You know, well, I think that's just not, you know, that's, I guess that's the claim. Yeah, that it creates a different, it creates more of a demand for public goods, if you like, that social change, that type of identity change underpins a different kind of demand for a different way of doing politics uh so uh okay Jim, you know, thank you very much the end is small so, so there are a little bit more questions we will wrap up so just a reminder we do have a, a google forum a google group where we you can interact with the speaker if if jim would like us to go that road or you can just forward email to him if you want and asking questions well thank you very much it was terrific it was a great honor to have you here. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. So we reconvene. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah. So we reconvene next week. And thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Cheerio.